Patrick Bed David immigrated to America from Iran. He later served in the U.S. military and eventually became a successful entrepreneur and a new media innovator. PBD is focused on bringing common sense back to America's discourse and preserving the values that have made America the freest and most prosperous society in the world. We discuss the key components of success, including a strong marriage, family, mindset, and of course, freedom. Hi. How are you? It's, uh, it's good to see you. Yes, likewise. Pat, you are so prolific. I, how do you describe what you do? How do I describe what I do? I would say at the core, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a creative, uh, I'm a fighter, but uh, a strategist, I would say those would be some of the things. Of course, aside from being a father and husband, you know, father of four, but at the core, I would say that's who I am. How many books have you written? I've written a few. The, the most recent one that uh, did well is Your Next Five Moves. It's a business book, strategy book that we wrote. And uh, that was an exciting project. The next one that's coming out is called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. It's a business planning book, but the key is to identify your enemy. If you got an enemy, it's going to bring out a different side of you. Too many people choose the wrong enemy. So this is the next one that's coming out December 5th. All right. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I, I'm curious. You've, you've really stepped into the arena. I've watched you in a lot of interviews. You were in Joe Rogan and my friend Dave Rubens doing all these shows. You're writing all these books. You run the, are you still running the, uh, a company? Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm running nine yeah. companies. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's vision. It's history. It's, I'm a control guy. I'm a freedom guy. And I'm not a fan of bullies. I never have. Since I was a kid, I was not a fan of bullies. So, and I'm seeing a lot of that happening right now. Uh, you know, we've made some good choices where financially, you know, we sold the insurance company a year and a half ago. It was a beautiful thing. You know, when, when that sold, we built the insurance company from zero to 50,000 agents. We had a nice exit and I'm still operating that for a few more months. But everything else for me is um, vision of why America gave me the life that I have today. I'm very grateful for that. I want to keep fighting for it. To me, I think uh, once you make the money, you have a few different responsibilities. Whether I read the legacy on what the Kennedy's family was all about, or I read the legacy of what the Bush family was all about, there's always a godfather at the top that's teaching certain things to that family. Whether it's Prescott or whether it's Joseph, I relate to that wiring. Joseph being Joseph Kennedy, challenging the kids to become who they became in Prescott, or even prior to that, you know, to raise kids that are fighters, that are tough, that are competitors. At the same time, good citizens, net positive to the economy, net positive to society. But once you make your money, you have a few different choices to give back. One is nonprofit, which is kind of what you guys are doing with Prager. You guys are doing an amazing job. The other one is government to get into politics. I'm not born here, so I have no aspirations to go be a governor and I can't be a president. So that one's out. The other one is you can go do charity work in a way of, you know, I'm going to go give back to education. I'm going to start a school or maybe do some of those things like physical, physical school. I'll do that, but I'll do that in my 60s. Not right now. Some would call us right now being an educational university, online university. But I want a physical culture, toughness. You know, you're talking about your experience being in the Israeli military. What that taught you when you went to UCLA, the byproduct of a great leader. And a lot of folks from your community that I've interviewed or recruited, they're professionals. They're not afraid. They're tough. They're strong. You feel the presence of how strong they are. So I respect that a lot. That means there's an institution or an environment that bred that toughness into those people. I want to be able to do that, but that's going to be my 60s. So for us to give back right now is I think the marketplace is lacking uh, media power that is selling the concepts that I believe in, whether it's capitalism, whether it's debate, whether it's, you know, reading books, education, conservative values. We see an opening and we want to be a competitor in that space. You mentioned uh, my experience in the military. You also served in the military. I did. Will you share a little bit about that? And what do you think that had done to your character? So I go to the army and, uh, you know, while I'm joining the army, I go in and I'm, I'm not somebody you can control or tell what to do. I don't do well with, you better do this or you better do that. It just doesn't do well with me. Now I'm in an environment where you better do that or else. So I've never met my match. So one day we have this drill sergeant who's 5'8", 
He walks very slow and talks like this. Hey, Ben David, how's your day? Why don't you drop and give me 20? Go for a two-mile run. That's how he talks. So me and three other guys, we're these tough guys from L.A., Chicago, New York, and we're just being the typical 18-year-old high testosterone, pushing our weight. So finally, one day, he has had enough. So he says, guys, get in the Humvee. I'm going to take you guys somewhere. So he's driving for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. We go to the back 40. We're in the back 40. And then he gets out. He puts his hat down. Then he takes his BDU jacket off. And he says, who wants to go first? And we're like, what do you mean? He said, who wants to go first? First what? He says, I'm not your drill sergeant right now. I'm just a guy right now. He gives his first name. He says, anybody who wants to fight right now, let's go. I said, listen, drill sergeant, we don't want to hurt you. You know, we're all big guys and he's a little guy. He says, no, no, don't worry about hurting me. I won't tell anybody. But who wants to go first? One of us steps up, one by one by one by one. He destroys all of us. Never hits our face. Everything that he hit was below the neck. So he knew here to hurt you. But at the end, he looks at us. It's done. He puts his jacket on, puts his hat on. He says, so now, you guys realize I run the show? Yes, drill sergeant. We will never talk about this ever again. Get in the Humvee. We went back to the unit, moving forward. Everything was, you know, to the T, respect. This is the man. He was the alpha, was clear. He's in charge. And my dad, there's a picture of me and my dad. I'm standing like this next to him. My dad's talking to him. And he's telling my dad, he says, we were able to do to your son what you guys couldn't do in 18 years. He's kind of having this fun conversation with him. But what happened is I got order. I got discipline. I finally found somebody that I couldn't no longer like get away with anything. My mother was a single mother. You couldn't raise me by yourself. And my dad couldn't tell me what to do. And this guy, they put order. I realized about respect in a manner of, you know, other people have a lot to offer to you. I love discipline. I started falling in love with routine, waking up at four o'clock in the morning, going to, you know, exercise and PT. Then you come to chow hall. Then Tolstin's going to give me the eggs that I like. Then I go back and change and I go to my uh, motor pool. I'm working with Sergeant Braxton and all these guys come back, go to, you know, the gym, that routine effect that we had, I got a mm-hmm. hold of. So the routine I learned from military, the discipline, the working 80 hours a week, the camaraderie, you don't make any money. That played a very big role in any other business I ever ran. If it wasn't for the military, I would have not been at the levels that I'm at right now. No way. Do you think more American kids should join the military? I mean, there's this kind of culture right now where they almost poo-poo on kids that go to the military. Uh, They're like, oh, go to college. Don't go to the military. Military is for dumb kids that are losers. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I speak to people like you. I'd venture to guess that you get more out of your military service than most colleges these days. Yeah, so that's a good question. But the only question is, uh, let's rank standards, right? What is the standards of today's military versus I went versus 20 years prior mm. to me or 40 years prior to me? Because if the standard goes lower, what is the military? If I'm going to a country club, no, I don't want more people to go to yeah. a military. I want them to go to a private, you know, three-month program that somebody runs independently that I can run my kids to. I want that, right? So I think there is a need today for the two, three-month programs for people to send their kids to see how tough you are. And it's maybe trained by ex-Navy SEALs and ex-Rangers and ex-Special Ops type of guys. And you go for three months and you get the toughness, you get the discipline, you get the camaraderie, you get the teamwork, you come out. I just don't see that happening right now in the Army. Army right now, they're walking on eggshells. There's a lot of things drill sergeants cannot do. Uh, There's a lot of he said, she said. You kind of, you know, have to be extremely careful. So the military today is not the military before. Now, having said that, if somebody's able to go to some kind of a special program, the SEALs, you know, special forces, rangers, something like that, where the standards are still held high, mm. I'm fully supportive of it. But more and more I talk to people in the military, they talk about how much the standards have lowered and boot camp is not what it used to be 10 years ago, let alone 20, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. That's pretty scary. I mean, you're talking about the general erosion of many institutions in America, institutions that you know we grew up thinking that we should trust and rely on military. I mean, for me, the American Medical Association mm-hmm. has been a giant failure. Uh, I don't know how we trust them anymore when they say that there's no difference between male and female and a doctor shouldn't even check for that anymore. 
have you noticed that too? Are you also disenchanted with these institutions? And what do you think we do about that? I think common sense is going to prevail. Uh, I think if you take 100 people, say America, and we bring it down to 100 people, when they say these nonsense type of ideas, like, for example, CNN said how parents screaming at their kids has the same level of harm, if not more, as sexual abuse. So, so let, me, let me say this one more time. So parents screaming at their kids has the same effects, if not worse than sexual abuse and physical abuse. Yeah. Okay, so the average parent reads this. You ask yourself a few questions. Number one, is this writer who wrote this, does this person have any kids? Okay, maybe they do. Number two, are they straight? Okay, maybe they are. Number three, how are your kids doing? Okay, number four, who the hell are you to write something like this saying raising the voice is the same as sexual abuse? But say 5% of the audience reads it and they say, oh my God, they're right. As a kid, my dad mm-hmm. screamed at me. And because of that, that's why I have yeah, PTSD I'm and I'm a victim and I'm this, right? So then that person who typically complainers are much better at getting attention than responsibility people. You go give a message. They say a negative review of a business, people will tell 11 different people. A positive review, people will tell three different people. So if I hear rumor about you, I'm telling 11. But if you treat me well today and you give me a compliment, you brought me a nice gift, I tell three people. Right. Just the basic- Negativity. The basic negativity sells more than positivity. So what does that mean? Well, if let's say 10% of the audience read that message, but it spreads three, four times more, that 10% becomes 40%. Because the other side that thinks it's stupid doesn't say anything about it. So the 10% officially looks like it's 40% of the population, but it's not. It's a small little community that thinks we ought to investigate this a little bit more and see what's going on with parenting. No, I think the right people with responsibility and common sense are not loud enough. I think the wrong people who are victims and lack responsibility are very loud. And their message sounds more convincing. They sound like they have a bigger army. They sound like they have bigger backing. And people are falling for that trap. So, but eventually what ends up happening is common sense ends up prevailing. Very simple. Eventually people are going to wake up and they're going to say, wow, that was a pretty bad idea. That was a pretty bad idea, guys, we had, but it took us 15 years. And during that 15 years, guess what happened? You destroyed a lot of kids' lives that transition. Mm -hmm. You are responsible for destroying these kids' lives. That was a bad policy. You know, the World Economic Forum, they're having a conversation about the fact that, well, we know the, the... vaccine, we were almost able to get everybody vaccinated worldwide, but we failed. We know climate change as a messaging is not, you know, easy enough. Uh, It's too complicated to get people to uh, panic, but we feel the water crisis is a type of a panic that everybody can relate to and we can get them finally to embrace climate change and the risk of climate. So, so all they're looking for is messaging to see. So now they're going to use water crisis to put the fear into people. Again, you you have to be naive to not see what's going on. But unfortunately, the people with the right arguments are either afraid of talking or either just living their lives and taking care of their families or either trying to grow themselves. And like, I don't have time for this nonsense. What they don't realize is this is all about an optics game. The other side is winning. It's good to see organizations like yourself that you're going out there and you're fighting this and you're all over the place. But we need more of that because the victims right now message is sounding like it's more popular, yet it's not. I completely agree with you. And and I would add that, you know, while I'm very proud of the work that we do at PragerU, we need people who are in the business community to speak out, people who actually understand people, people who have run, you know, have an impact on, on our economy and our society. And behind closed doors, they're all having these conversations. They're all saying ESG is completely crazy or this victim mentality is eroding our workforce. But they're not bold enough to speak about it publicly because, you know, they'll come to me and say, Marissa, we love what you do. Thank you so much for what you do. But you know what? Nobody can hear that I'm even speaking with you right now because my my uh, my bank account will be hurt if they know that mm-hmm. I'm speaking out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then people like you who are basically saying, "Look, I've made my money, I've built my business, but if I don't protect this country, where do we go? Where do we go?" And I I, I just think it's so important that people step into the arena in the way you have. Uh, my question for you is: You're a branding guy, right? I I read your book. I want to talk 
about some examples in your book that I think really can be applicable to think about even America and its brand and its marketing and the the concept behind knowing yourself, like knowing who we are as a country and being able to stand for. How do we do that for America? And this erosion that we're talking about in our society, I think is related to some sort of lack of understanding of who we are and how we brand who we are. Totally. You know, it, the, the, there was a time where Real estate uh, was looking around and seeing that more people started renting than buying a house. And it was a problem. Realtors like, what are we going to do about this? This is years ago. So they hire a marketing guy that comes in and all these big real estate guys come together with this marketing guy. And he says, you guys have a messaging problem. He says, okay, so how do we fix this messaging problem? He says, what you have to do is you have to realize that immigrants around the world are coming to America, okay, for one thing. And it's called the American dream. No other country has the brand tied with a dream. Nobody says the Russian dream or the German dream or the Turkish dream. Everybody says the American dream. So great job to the people in the past that sold the American dream. But this marketer was brilliant. He says, we have to link the American dream to a behavior. And what we have to link that behavior to is when you put the key in the door and you open it up, and you become a first-time homeowner. If we can say the American dream begins with home ownership, it's game over. Everybody will link buying a house in America to living the American dream. So guess what happens? Real estate takes up. You want to live the American dream? Why don't you go buy a house? So all the commercials were like, oh my God, babe, this is such a dream. We just got married two, two years ago and we're finally living the American dream. You open the door, you go in the house. And you see all these happy faces, so other people want to buy a house. Where in reality, the American dream has nothing to do with home ownership. <laughs> the American dream has to do with business, with free enterprise, with free market, with freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. But kudos to that marketer that was able to do it. So for us, like I, I was, in, I, I've been in the insurance business since uh, uh, 2002. Okay, there's nobody in the world that will say anything sexy about the insurance industry. Nobody. You don't say insurance. I can't wait to meet my insurance agent tonight. Babe, guess what we're going to talk about today? What's that? We're going to talk about if you die, I get a million bucks. Isn't that cool, right? So that's the business I was in for 20 years. So I had to figure out a way. Because if you go to an insurance conference, you know, they even made a movie about insurance industry, Cedar Rapids. And it tells you all the dumb things about the insurance industry. We were able to take an industry like that and see the problem in the insurance industry. Numbers came out showing the average agent was a 56-year-old white male. This was in 2008. Limra comes out with this report. So I said, okay, if the average agent is a 56-year-old white male, the average thing these guys like to do, ha, 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 let's go golf and they do this kind of stuff. I said, we got to change it up. So what do we do? We go and we focus on recruiting women. At the time, only 17% were women selling insurance. This is 2008. Our company, out of the 50,000 agents, 51, 52% are women. The average agent in our company becomes a 34-year-old Hispanic female. Why? Because I noticed when a man goes and sells insurance, uh, a man may trust a man, but a woman be like, I don't know if I feel comfortable that he wants the best for me. But if a woman went on an insurance uh, uh, sales call, the, the wife would relate to her the mother would relate to the mom and the husband would say, okay, she's pleasant to listen to more than Johnny. You know what, babe? Let's buy an insurance policy because man is trying to please two women. So he just pleased two, the salesperson and the wife. Bingo, we sold an insurance policy. So the closing rate for women selling was higher than men. Okay, what happens to that business? It took off and we built a few hundred offices nationwide and it became what it became. So America today, the enemy is doing a great job because the enemy is supposed to pin America on how bad it is. Okay, the enemy is supposed to sell America as this, you know, evil empire that wants to be involved in everything and wants to be touching everything and wants to know everyone's business. And by the way, a part of that is true. So part of messaging is right. We have 780 military bases. We want to be involved in every war. We want to be involved with everything with Ukraine. We want to be involved with, you know, the video was shown in Lebanon where a guy was trying to protest for LGBTQ Pride Day and, and they shut down the protesting. And they said, don't, don't America or Lebanon. We don't want to be like America. We don't want to have these values. So America is no longer the America that we had 40 years ago because America 40 years ago was values, principles, maybe even 60 years ago. 
God, values, principles, hard work, military, you know, protection, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You want to be a Christian? No problem. You want to be a Muslim? No problem. You want to be a Scientologist? No problem. And we had this fundamental value that we were selling. Today, unfortunately, the, the problem is the, the people that are undermining what America was founded on is not outsiders. Is the addition, is yeah. the other political party. So the other side of the political party or the globalists, or you want to talk about the establishment, is trashing the package we always sold. So now our own people are demonizing what made America great. So the customer who are the immigrants that we want, the ones that are the smart, math, intellectual, that have a lot of things to bring to America, they're now sitting there saying, is America still the same America as it was 40 years ago? Do I want to take them there or no? You know what? Let's think about a little bit. Versus the immigrants that we're getting is not those immigrants. It used to be the immigrants you wanted. Like in sports, this whole game of free agency, right? When a guy is a free agent, the free agents in any sport, they typically look at what teams? They're either looking at for money or if you've never won a championship, you want to win a championship. Mm -hmm. So if you want money, you'll go to a shitty market to go get your $200 million contract. But if you're doing it because you want a championship, you may take a little bit less of a contract, but you want to go to the Yankees. You want to go to the Lakers. You want to go to Miami. You want to go to New York. You want to go to the bigger markets to win something. Uh, if we look at immigrants, the people that we want as free agents, those immigrants are no longer looking at us the way they did 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're weighing their options. Now, the good news is there are not a lot of better options than America still today. The bad news is we're no longer as attractive as we were 40 years ago. For example, a, a friend of yours calls you. These guys, this best friend of yours, she's been married to her husband for 20 years. And she calls you, she says, I hate to say this to you, but we're thinking about getting a divorce. And you say, what? Yeah, we're thinking about getting a divorce. No, you're not. We, we thought you're fully happy. No, last three, four years, just kind of been very messy. And now the kids, you know, the oldest one is out, 18. We got a 16 year old, kind of realizing we're just roommates. You know, we no longer like love each other like we did. Okay, cool. Now, if there is betrayal or falling out of love and you're bored out of your mind or whatever, there's many reasons, some reasons that make sense to get it. My parents got a divorce, best decision that they ever made, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm kind of glad they got the divorce. And, you know, the only thing is they divorced twice. They got married, my sister's born, they got a divorce. They got remarried, I'm born, they got a divorce. That's my parents, my mom and dad. So your job now is to try to get her and him to stay together. That is not an easy job. It's always easier to say what? You yeah. know, my, you know, coworker is much easier when I go to lunch with him. He's much nicer or, you know, such and such. I go to lunch with her. She's so sweet. She actually compliments me. My wife hasn't complimented me for, let's just say guys saying that, sure. right? Okay. And every marriage is going to go through this. It's not easy. And this is why when we got married, I told my wife and everybody at my wedding, I said, I know for a fact we're going to be married for one year. That I know for a fact. I didn't say we're going to be married forever. I said, we're going to take it one year at a time because it's very hard. Marriage is very, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Kids is hard, but marriage is super hard. What does this have to do with America? What point are you making? America's going through a divorce right now. Mm. And when you're going through a divorce, what is the hardest thing to do? To get people to talk to each other. Mm. Get them at the table to talk to each other. The less we talk to each other, the more we're going to get a divorce. So what do we do with Vitamin and, and Peabody Podcast? My model was we believe in debate. We believe in entertain. We believe in empower. We believe in enlighten. That's what we believe in. But our core thing, we love debate. So yesterday we have Ann Coulter and we have a big debate. Last week we have Stephen Schmidt, the founder of uh, Lincoln Project. Ugly debate, okay? But it was a good conversation. Then we have Cenk Uger. Then we have Alex Jones. Then we have Chris Cuomo. Then we have Charlie Kirk. Then we have Muslims on one side with Christians on this side. We're going to keep bringing people to the table. And that's the hardest thing to do to bring people together. Book I read many, many years ago uh, uh, that I think I talked about briefly with Dave Rubin as well. Uh, uh, it was called Barbarians to Bureaucrats, how the society starts off with the prophet. Then it goes to the prophet is the visionary. One day we're going to be this. One day, Steve Jobs. One day, you know, Benjamin Franklin, you know, George Washington. And then the prophet finds barbarians, those that are willing to do the fight. And then they find the builders and the explorers who build the technology, go into a new market, expand into this. Then comes the administrator. We need to write some laws and processes and all this stuff. And then comes the bureaucrats and aristocrats. These are the guys with fancy degrees who have done the case studies. They've never really actually run a company. They've never been a part of a startup. They've never been part of military. And you know what happens next? It's the fall. 
So in this book, Lawrence Miller explains the only way, Lawrence Miller, the only way to save this society, this company, is to bring a synergist in that's going to get everybody to talk to one another. So I run a company on, on the company side. We have home office. We have sales. One day, a couple of my executives on the home office side, they said, we don't think it's fair that these sales guys are making a million dollars a year and we're only making $250,000. I said, oh, really? You don't think it's fair? Oh, my God. Totally get it. So they started kind of talking down to sales guys behind closed doors, not to their face, but behind closed doors. I said, let me ask you a question. Eight of them are sitting around me. I says, what time do you go home every night? Oh, I work late, six o'clock. Oh, you work till six o'clock? Okay, what a hard job you got working till six o'clock for your $250,000, your salary. Let me make a couple calls real quick. I call my sales leaders. They have no clue what's going on. I say, hey, what's your last appointment today? Oh, I got a nine o'clock. Where? Long Beach. Where do you live? Granada Hills. How long of a drive is that? Pat, I don't know why you're asking me this. What's your drive? An hour. What time are you going to finish up your last appointment? It's, it's a second appointment. I'm closing. So probably 10, I'm going to be done at 1030. So what time will you get home to the kids? Oh, 1130. I'll get home. Okay, cool. Will the kids be asleep? Pat, of course, they sleep at 830. What's your schedule look like tomorrow? What's your first appointment? 8 a.m. What's your last appointment tomorrow? 9 p.m. Are you working on Saturday? I am. What's your day look like? I start at 8 a.m. What time do you end? Five in the afternoon. On Saturday. Yeah. Any appointments on Sunday? I just have one appointment and I got a call. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Take care, buddy. Click. Next guy. Next guy. I said, do you want his schedule? Oh, no, 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 no. I said, so the next time you trash and you think just because you got a degree and you're wondering why these guys make more money than you, they work their asses off. You get home every night to have dinner with your wife and kids and they don't. And they said, Patrick, the best perspective you could have given us. And then boom, they had respect for the sales guys. Now, sometimes sales guys look at executive and what do those guys ever do? And ah, da, 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 these guys don't know what they're talking about. And one day I sat down my sales guys. I say, come here, let me show you something here. Let's go on the software here. The software here, how long did it used to take you to submit a policy? Oh, Pat, it was a shit show. 90 days until we got paid. Exactly. How long does it take you right now to get paid? A week. You know why? Why? Because what home office did. And they're like, oh my God, I never thought about it that way. I said, your 17 complaints you got last week, did they call you? No, they called these guys. They took care of it. So then they started having respect for one another, okay? And they realized, yeah, we are better here and you're better here, but let's work together. We don't have somebody in the middle that's pointing out why we need the other side, why we need the people that are working at DMV and police officers and firefighters and why we need the job creators and the bartender and the waiter and the waitress and the Uber driver, why we need these guys. We have more people that are sitting there telling these guys to hate them and telling these guys to hate these guys. This is the most strikes we've ever had in the history of America. We've never had this many strikes. You got the UAW strike. You saw writers uh, going through their strike. You saw actors going through their Jimmy Kimmel and Fallon just started doing their show. They haven't done a show for four months since May 12th, four and a half months. Why? Because union is whispering what? They're not taking care of you. Look how much that CEO made. That CEO got a 36% raise. You only got a 10% raise. It's not fair. Yeah, but the CEO is doing X, Y, Z job. You're not. You can't sit there and say, well, the CEO makes more money than I do. Why don't you do what the CEO does? The CEO stresses out 24-7. You stress out while you're at work. You don't stress out after you go out home. There's a reason. So that person in the middle, to paint a picture of both sides, is not that. Who's more important? Well, my wife doesn't do anything. Well, my husband, I don't know what he does at work. Let's paint a picture. The more we paint a picture, the more we bring them like this. No one's doing this. Everybody's job today is doing this. And that division goes wider and wider and wider. And then eventually we don't even want to talk to each other. Then we fall apart. Who is the person in the middle speaking to? The population? Because the people who are driving us in different directions yes. are incentivized to drive us in a different direction, whether it's media or social media or even politicians, right? How do they rally people up by basically saying that the other side is just so awful that unless people lean into it fully, yeah. the world's going to collapse, right? So if you're talking about this middle person who's trying to bring common sense and for people to realize the nuances behind their decisions, who are these people that you talk to? Is it the general public? Is that what we do? We we have a, a, a perspective that is trying to enlighten the America in general? Well, I mean, first of all, you can't wait to get the people that are speaking to flip 
and start taking this approach because they're not going to do it. This business model division is a very good business mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. It's a business model that worked for mainstream media companies, for CNN, for MSNBC, for Fox, for all these guys. It's mm -hmm. worked very mm -hmm. well, okay? The, the C-letter words, right? Change, conflict, you know, any of those things. Uh, uh, you can get the attention of people is what you're looking at. Controversy, conflict, change. You're constantly pitching that. You're pitching that. You're pitching that. That's great. What happened with CNN during uh, COVID and during Trump? They lost credibility. Zucker got fired. Cuomo, they fired Cuomo because of what happened. It was him defending his brother. Lemon's no longer there. Where's CNN? What happened to Fox? Who was at Fox? In the last 20 years, who were the goats at Fox? Beck, not there. O'Reilly, not there. Megyn Kelly, not there. Tucker Carlson, not there. These are the four goats they've had the last 20 years. Where are these guys? Where are they? What happened to Fox? Yeah. Okay, we're watching a Fox debate. I'm in LA. We saw each other at Ronald Reagan Library. Topic of discussion, TikTok. TikTok's advertising on the debate, on Fox. This is on Fox while they're doing the debate and TikTok is advertising. So you like when you, when you see this, you're like, okay, guys, what are we doing here? Like, what are we trying to do? So there is a business model for divorces. For example, husband and wife want to set up a nuptial agreement. In any state you do, you pretty much need to represent your lawyer and my lawyer. We're married. We want to write up a nuptial agreement. We're about to get married. We want to write up a pre nuptial agreement, prenuptial, pre-married, post-nuptial, after we got married, now we want to write it up. Either way, we're writing a nuptial agreement. You call your lawyer. How much does it cost to write a nuptial agreement? Oh, it's not going to cost more than three to five thousand dollars. You sure? Yes. I call my lawyer. How much does it cost? Three to five thousand dollars. No problem. Then we get together. Hi, babe. Hey, these are arrangements. We've already have it written out. This is what we want to do. Okay, cool. That's great. So now we think we got to score away. And my guy is to protect me and your guy is to protect you. Then in a meeting, your lawyer says, look, out of all the marriage, I think you're being a little bit lenient with your husband. Okay. I don't think he's giving you as much as the average husband gives to their wives. Look, I'm not trying to get in between you guys, but he's just not giving you enough. And uh, I don't know. I'm here to, uh, you're my client. You're my number one priority. What I may want to do is, if you're comfortable with it, I'd like to go and ask his lawyer for X, Y, Z. Okay. So now, your lawyer calls my lawyer. My lawyer then calls me. Who am I calling next? I'm calling you. Babe, what the, f what, what's this all about, babe? What are you talking about, babe? How dare you ask me a question like that? We already agreed on this. Babe, the lawyer told me that, no, 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 no. I can't even believe you said this. Well, now I don't trust you. Now it became business. Okay. So now you go back and no, it's okay. It's this, this, that. It's okay. I'm going to do that or I'm not going to do that. Now we're either fighting, but no matter how much we fight, you eventually realize they're on the same team. They're not on our team. They're the same team. The more we fight, the more fees we pay them. Two and a half months later, that three to $5,000 became $11,800. Bingo. They made more money the more we fought. Guess what the business model is? The more Republicans and Democrats fight, the more mainstream media makes money. Mm -hmm. That's a business model. The more they sit there and tell me, women are supposed to hate men. Men are supposed to hate women. Why? Hey, choose your enemies wisely. Hey, feminist, wrong enemy you chose, men, because now you're 65 years old, not married with no kids. What's life all about? How many guys you slept with? How many boyfriends you had? How many husbands you had? How many promotions you got? How many times you can say, I don't need men? Really? That's the life? You can really sell me on that life? I don't think you can sell me on that life. Maybe you can sell it to me with your alcohol and you're bitter and you're unhappy, but you have to reason and sit there and say, I made a mistake choosing the wrong enemy that stole 40 minutes of your life. So the business model of dividing, it is such a powerful business model. I'll never forget the first time I started the insurance company. We're at the office till four o'clock in the morning. I said, my seven guys are sitting there. They know who these seven guys are. I said, how are you guys feeling? We're going to take over the world, Pat. I said, I believe it. But I want to tell you guys one last thing before we wrap up. What's that? Two of you guys will turn against me within three to six months. And you're going to try to get other people to go with you. That, that'll that never happen. And a person that said that'll never happen is a person that did it. Okay? Why though? Not because of them. My former enemies, who are my newer enemies, called to try to divide everybody. One guy went to everyone's home that night trashing me at everyone's house that night. And he got two people to buy in. You know, those two people that bought in, you know what they said 10 years later? One of the biggest mistakes they made in their lives. Because if they were in their lives, it would be very different. But what happened? The divider won. 
the divider won. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful business model on pinning people against each other. They do it so eloquently. But the American people are in a marriage right now and they have to wake up. Republicans are not the enemy. Democrats are not the enemy. We can have different opinions. You can be a Yankees, I'm a Red Sox. I'm a Yankees, you're Red Sox, no problem. I'm a Lakers, you're Clippers, no problem. I'm whoever you are, whoever, no problem. We got 48 things on the board, okay? Let's eliminate the bottom 50% that doesn't really matter in life. Let's eliminate the bottom 20% that's left. Let's take the top 10. On these 10 things, how much of them do we agree? Seven out of 10, we're passing. For example, let's say you're pro-choice. I'm pro-life, no problem. It's okay, we can debate it. Let's have a debate. I'll tell you why I'm pro-life. You can tell me why you're pro-choice, but that doesn't make me evil and it doesn't make you evil. It just means we have a different view of life. My banking on pro-life, maybe it's based on my faith and I'm taking a risk, believing this is what God wants me to do. Faith isn't believing something you have not yet seen. I haven't met Jesus yet. I haven't had dinner with him yet. I haven't broken bread with him yet, but I'm taking the risk of being pro-life. To you, you have a personal life experience that you had. You're taking a position of pro-choice. We disagree but we still agree on seven other issues. That messaging is not attractive because the business model of mainstream media needs these guys to hate each other. And the American people have fallen for it. And unfortunately, if we continue falling for this trap, this great country will not be the United States, it'll be the divided states. That's what they want. They want us to be divided. And what we wanna do is we wanna bring these guys that disagree and sit down and talk and afterwards have a cigar and almost nine out of 10 times when I bring two people that completely disagree with them after we have a cigar together, you know what they say? Shit, you ain't that bad, bro. I kind of like, I don't know why I kind of like you. I don't want to like you, but I kind of like, it's the best line I love to hear. Yeah. I don't know if I like you, but I kind of like you. We need more of that. Mm -hmm. What we read about Tip O'Neill, Reagan going afterwards, having a drink. We don't have that today. Mm -hmm. People don't even want to talk to each other today. It's embarrassing. And the example you give of the debates is so on the money. I mean, we were there with people who we know are friends, right? They are friends. And the media is banking off them just attacking one another. I just, I, all of our faces there were, we were just cringing because we, at the end of the day, these are all good people. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're being attacked, you give the example of the attorneys. It's so true. It's, it, it's like when the attorneys bank off of people fighting, it's the same thing with the media. So we both stepped into this new media, independence versus the legacy media. We're the independent ones. Mm -hmm. Is that the future? Is that what you think could help bring America back together, rebrand America, bring back common sense, put America actually first in that way and not, you know, the interest of the enemy first? Here's what's going to happen. The business model of those who are great readers of teleprompters and look pretty is gone. Mm -hmm. You take a teleprompter individual that knows how to put clothes together, knows how to do nice makeup and looks attractive, guy or girl on camera and tell them, go run a podcast and see if you can get 100,000 subs. Go ahead, go run a podcast and see if you can get 100,000 subs within a year or two. We'll give you two years. Let's do project. No teleprompter though. You just talk to the camera or interview people. See how you do, okay? No help by yourself. Start a podcast. See how you'll do. Yeah, of course I could do it. You realize I went to Columbia. I went to this. I went to... Go ahead and do it. No, you're a great reader of a teleprompter. Okay, and God forbid that teleprompter. Teleprom what am I supposed to say now? Hey, Johnny, tell me what to say. Tell me what to say. <laughs> Those guys are getting exposed. Okay, period. Yeah. This is not an easy game. And what the American people, big uh, uh, credit goes to Joe Rogan, what American people have shown is we just want to see regular people talk to one another. I think why the market trusts you guys, you're a nonprofit model. They're given to you guys. It's charity they're giving to you, that's donation that they're giving to you. And they're saying, we want to more of this. Please keep doing what you're doing, right? Please keep doing what you're doing is what the audience is saying. On the mainstream media side, they're about to get disrupted. By the way, one policy will destroy mainstream media. One policy mm -hmm. will destroy mainstream media. And this is a policy I'm fully for. I hope they do it. I don't think they will, but I hope they do it. One policy that would completely destroy mainstream media would be, there's only two countries in the world that allow for big pharma to advertise, us and New Zealand. Since when do we follow New Zealand's lead? Never. No one wakes up in the morning saying, what does New Zealand do? Let's do what New Zealand does, right? Can you imagine if we follow New Zealand's lead? What a weird thing to think about, right? If a president came out with an executive order saying starting tomorrow, Big Pharma can no longer advertise on TV. You know what would happen? If Big Pharma can't advertise on TV, like this, 80% of mainstream media is gone 
within two to three years. Within two to three years. If one president had the audacity to change that one law and says, look, 194 other countries don't do it. Why are we doing it? Why is it all our kids are taking all these opioids and all these drugs and all these Xanax and all this stuff they're addicted to? Why? Maybe because we advertise so much. So why don't we start off with, go to the doctor, see what the doctor recommends and start there. We don't need to have all these advertisements in front of our face all the time. I'll talk to my doctor. Let's see what the doctor has to say to me. Well, no, 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 no. That's not fair. Why don't you let the capitalism do its part and all this other stuff? I'm okay with capitalism doing its part. No problem. But I'm not okay with you being in front of the faces of everybody, constantly telling them to buy a drug. And we've seen what's going on with our kids in America. Maybe we put a pause on that. What do you think? What's the difference between that and cars? And what's the difference between that and this? Then let's have the conversation together. But if 194 other countries don't do it, why don't we stop as well? By the way, it would be a scary day for mainstream media if that were to happen. And in order for that to happen, do you know how many lobbyists these guys would have to make sure that never takes place? They're stacked. Some of the most powerful lobbyists are controlled by Big Pharma. So it would take somebody with a lot of guts to do it. But if it did happen, it would accelerate the disruption of media by tenfold. You know, it's not just that the advertisements are the problem. The other problem is that because the they're so reliant on big pharmaceuticals for, for the money, mm -hmm. that the actual news agencies cannot report bad things about the pharmaceuticals. That's the issue. It's not just the ads themselves. Is that like people like Tucker were, were penalized yeah. because they wanted to speak about the dangers of some of these pharmaceuticals and they couldn't because the networks wouldn't let them. And that's, I think, one of the, the I completely agree with you. I want to show you something, um, switching the subject a little bit. Uh, I um, read your book during a time that growing PragerU started getting real hard. It got real hard. And you said something like, if you want something and you want it badly, know that you're going to experience pain. I'm paraphrasing it into my own words. Uh, but it really, it did affirm how important it is that if you want to Go, do great things. You just need to have that resilience, that hard work, that tenacity, no pain, no gain. Uh, so first of all, I just want to personally thank you because you got me through this period. After I put down your book, I went through a binge read. Do you know what this is? This is a McGuffey reader. Okay. So the McGuff, this is from the 1800s. This is, uh, I think, 18, 1880. Uh, this was the book that most American kids would read as their, whether literacy or math, this was basically the main readers. This reader is for fourth grade. If you look at it, you would be astonished. To fourth see. grade. Fourth grade. You would be astonished to see the level of the stuff in here. And this could have been a portion of your introduction. Fourth graders were, were, were taught this. The education, moral, and intellectual of every individual must be chiefly his own work. Rely upon it that the ancients were right. Both in moral and intellect, we give their final shape to our characters and thus become empathetically the architects of our own future. Mm. No excellence without labor. This is taught to fourth graders. The other thing that's in this book is faith having faith in religion, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting that you had such a big segment in your book about having religion. You know, if you grow up in America and you go to college, you're taught that, you know, there's no room for religion in a business. There's mm -hmm. no room for religion in education. The literacy level of the kids that were reading the McGuffey readers 100 years ago was way higher than the literacy level of Americans today, even though they were really operating schools or homeschools on a fraction of the cost. And I, I'm curious just your, your reaction to that and specifically the issue of religion and its, and its place in our education system or even our businesses. Yeah, it's so funny to me when I ask people that, uh, you know, hey, would you rather have, uh, uh, you have one of two choices. I asked this from Graham Stephan on his podcast. I said, would you rather have uh, schools uh, add God that every day it starts off with a prayer and they're, they're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, but they're starting off to pray. Well, we take out all the LGBTQ teaching in school, or you leave LGBTQ teaching, but you take out God. So, wow, it's a tough decision to make because I feel like you need both. And da, 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 and we're leaving out. So that's the problem, right? 
The problem is we no longer uh, uh, fear uh, a higher power and we no longer have faith in a higher power. Numbers came out that non-religious organizations are growing. Numbers of people that are no longer believing in a God is growing rapidly. But let's let's unpack that. Let's unpack the, and let's look at the profile of somebody that's an atheist that doesn't believe in God. And let's take the profile of somebody that believes in God. Earlier I asked you a question. I said, when you think about a person that smokes cigarettes versus a cigar smoker or a weed smoker, right? And you and I had an exchange together and we each gave our profile, right? Okay, sounds good. So now go to what is the profile of somebody that believes in God versus somebody, a profile of someone that doesn't believe in God. Okay, to me, somebody that doesn't believe in God gives me arrogant, conceited vibes that you know it all, that you don't need anybody's help, that you got life figured out and, you know, you know what you're doing and that's it. Okay, cool. And you're 100% self-reliant on yourself. Cool. No problem. Okay. Too big of a risk for me to take because I know myself. Way too big of a risk for me to take. So then the profile of somebody that believes in God. Okay, what are they saying? They're saying, I don't know it all. I can't do life by myself. I need someone's help. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I fear that if I do the wrong behavior, there's going to be a potential responsibility, liability. Maybe I'm going to go to hell. Maybe I'm going to go to heaven, but I better live a good life based on these values and principles. Okay, sounds good. So let's unpack that. Now let's go. If you have a choice between you know, living in a Christian nation, uh, in a nation that believes in God or in a, co God, a country that doesn't believe in God. So let's take the religions, Christianity, Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah. You take any of these things, right? Would you rather believe in that or someone that has, you know, non-religious beliefs? No, I would want to live in a Christian nation. Okay, fantastic. Why though? Well, because there's a certain set of values and principles that I know I'm going to be protected with. Okay, great. No problem. So the more and more and more you go through this, you realize the profile of this versus the profile of this. They interviewed this guy that was a pedophile. He went to jail, he comes back, he comes out after 12 years of being in jail or something, and he agrees to do an interview. And the guy asks him a question, he says, what's the profile of kids you target? He says, oh, it's very easy for me. If the kid believes in God, I can't target that kid. Number two, if the kid has a strong father figure, I don't target that kid. Number three, if the kid has a great, great relationship with mom, dad, and siblings, I don't target that kid. I target kids that don't believe in God, that don't have a father figure, and they're not close to their families. Bingo. Well, maybe we need more of uh, fathers to be in pictures. Maybe we need more God in our lives. And maybe we need more families to stay together. This is why if I was a president, my tax incentives will be very different. Do you know in 1940, how many, what percentage of women that had kids were single mothers. You know what the percentage is? 4% in 1940. You know what it is today? 40%. Mm -hmm. We went from 4 to 40%. Why? Because our tax policies, the incentive program by yeah. FDR, and what LBJ did in 1964-65, his policies, it incentivized people to have kids out of wedlock <laughs> and to be single mothers. So what happened to our kids? Now the kids are being reckless and they don't have a father figure, kind of like that picture when that sergeant put his foot down with us and he kind of checked us and we're like, whoa, yeah, he's in charge. We better listen to him. We don't have that today. A boy needs it. A man needs it. A guy needs to experience what it is for someone to put him in his place, especially when you're younger. So I think it's a big risk we're taking in America to be so politically correct and trying to please everybody that we take God out of everything that we're doing. It's a nonsense. It's weak. It shows many of these men in these positions that are caving, are cowards, are afraid, are weak, are, uh, uh, you know, many words I can use for that rather than having a backbone to say, no, we're not. Now here's the profile. Somebody who may say bad things about a profile that's a believer in God, the person that's negative on this, they had a bad experience at a school or they had a bad experience with a father that was so much on top of God that he used the God to hit their kids. So they link pain to because of God was using that. That's not the same God we're talking about here. We're not talking about what some of the experiences happen with Catholic churches where they abuse their power. We're not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about a person that has faith, that believes in a higher power, that relies on it, that's a praying man or a woman, that has a certain level of fear and has certain level of respect and accountability. He's not sitting there saying, I'm perfect. I walk on water and, you know, judging everybody else around them. It's actually a person that judges less because it's kind of like, look, I'm not perfect. I have lived kind of a, some bad decisions I made in my life. Who am I to judge you? More coming from that standpoint, yeah, I want more here mm -hmm. than here. In America, trying to sell this more, it's actually a not, a it's not an attractive product to sell. 
you know, and the only reason people are buying it is not because it makes more sense. It's just because they're conforming because mm-hmm. they're scared. They're afraid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're being bullied, pushed around because they're being a little too tolerant rather than being intolerant. We need a little bit more intolerance in certain values and principles. Like I remember when anybody comes to me that tells me they want to get married, I said, what are your t- uh, top three non-negotiables? I said, what do you mean? I said, what are your top three non-negotiables? I don't understand the question. What are three things that he or she, if they have, you can't marry them? Never thought about that. Why don't you start there first? What are your non-negotiables? Okay. Normally it's what? I love her. Mm-hmm. She's so cute. He's so strong. She makes you know, me laugh. She makes me laugh. It's just, I don't know. Okay. You know, all this kind of <laughs> stuff. It's like, no, no. What is it? No. Like for me, non-negotiables to be someone that's in my house, going on the second floor of my house. My second floor of my house is not welcome to anybody until you meet certain criteria. Why? Because my kids live on the second floor, period. You don't go on the second floor. Why? This is my non-negotiable. No, don't, you don't question it. Non-negotiable, getting married. These are my non-negotiable. I can't do that. These are my non-negotiable for hiring, for business, for investment, for this. We ought to have these standards to be non-negotiables, but when you start compromising your non-negotiables, you no longer have a backbone you can be taken advantage of. And by the way, the church is doing this. Mm-hmm. Many Christians are becoming a little too tolerant and they're now non-negotiables are like, it's okay. It's not like, it's like we're living in 2023. What's the big deal? No, you don't have a backbone, unfortunately. Yeah. Get back to having your backbone like you once used to have. And now that you're famous, you've written a couple of books and people stop you when you go to these national Christian conventions and you're such a celebrity. Now you want to be a little bit softer because you want to win these 22 year olds that are bitching and complaining about you on TikTok. I don't care about what they're saying about me. I have a backbone, have a backbone. That's attractive, but those types of people are also knowing, but it's okay. That's how leaders are. Mm. An element of leadership is, look, I understand you don't like what I'm doing here. It's my job, totally get it. It is frustrating, but that's the decision we're making. We're not compromising this. We need more of that. We're lacking that today. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's disappointing to see leaders without conviction. What are your thoughts about marriage? Uh, many Young people, again, another one of those, I believe a myth coming from college is that you should not get married until you're financially set. Uh, do you disagree with me on on the idea that it should not matter? What, what are your thoughts? It varies based on uh, the individual. Let me explain, okay? When I'm 23 years old and I'm dating this girl and I love this girl, I want to marry this girl, we end up breaking up. We're together for three years. I ask myself, would you let your daughter marry the 23-year-old Pat? Mm. And the answer was no. Mm. No, I wouldn't. Well, then guess what? Go become the guy. You would be okay. Your daughter bring it home. That's what I did. Mm. So I answer my question like that because that guy was at the clubs five, six days a week. That guy was in Vegas 26 times a year. That guy's life was a very different life. And then one day, I'm like, no, yeah, my dad's about to die. He's having a heart attack. He's at UCLA Medical Center. I get kicked out of the hospital because I'm upset at what the nurses were doing that they're not attending to my dad. I'm downstairs in the car, my Ford Focus, and I'm like, yeah, no, I want my dad to be treated royally. I want people to know when he goes to the hospital, that's his last name. Now, that's important to me. So I was willing to suffer the pain to make sure that man is treated royally so the world knew who he was. But that's what drove me. Okay, so I got to work until he had to do that. And then I got to work till I got to choose who I wanted to marry because I want options. That's me. Okay, as a man, I wanted options. The whole word about settling, I didn't want to settle. I wanted to have somebody I married that was my choice. So if a man sits there and says, well, I want choices as well. Well, then go increase your market value. What do you do then? Whatever, go become a better man. Take care of your health. Go make your money. Be interested in certain things that are important, have values, have principles, get clear on yourself, be a person that gets the job done, you're a leader, and then you're going to have options of what's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that part. Now, that's if you want the choice of who you want to marry. Let's go on the other side. The other side is everybody else who is kind of like, I'm, you know, I'm just a regular person that's got a job and, you know, I'm. You want to have a family one day. I want to have kids one day. I want to do this. I want to do that. No problem. Obviously, where you find them is very important. When you're in business, 
I would have three different of my sales guys sit here and one guy would say, hey, Johnny, how do you always find these clients that roll over a million dollars and roll over half a million dollars and buy $3 million insurance policies? How do you do that? Because all I can find is $50 a month term policies that I'm selling. And that's why I'm finding these guys. Okay. Well, he would break it down and he would say, yeah, I belong to this club and I network at these events with high caliber people and I'm finding higher quality people. You are going to Walmart to prospect for clients (laughs) and that's the clients you're finding sometimes. You're going to this and this guy's only going to Chamber of Commerce. So this guy's going to Chamber of Commerce, the guy in the middle. This guy's prospecting at Walmart and Costco. And that goes going out to prospecting at a Soho house or a different kind of a club that you go to meet people, right? Okay. So now, if you want to find a high quality person to marry that maybe has right values and principles today, whatever life they lived before, it is what it is. But today, maybe it's probably not a good idea to go prospect at Tinder, okay? Because Tinder is probably... You know, a place that somebody's Friday night, if somebody's swiping right Friday night at 10 o'clock, they're telling you what they want at 10 o'clock Friday night. They're lonely. No problem. That's the demo. Okay. Maybe the demo you want to go here has got to be through a source that brings a higher profile candidates of people that are wife worthy. Again, if you're solving for marriage and kids here, so maybe a referral. If I trust you, I know you and you tell me, You got to meet this girl. I've known her for seven years. I've known her family for this many years. Pat, this is somebody you want to consider going on a date with. I think it'll be a match. You have a high credibility score with me. I trust you. I'm going to go on a date with that girl. Doesn't mean it's going to work out or not. But the pool of people I go out with for a wife has to be people that I have some kind of credit score to see what you've been up to. Tinder, I just met you. Oh my God, this is the first time I'm doing this. I've actually never done this before. Yeah. Yeah. First time. You just said this 78 times the last three weeks. Yeah. But it's my first time. Wow. Kind of nervous. What's going to happen? Is this kind of like one of those things? You just started your profile. Just started it. How long ago? Two weeks ago. It's been six year profile. You don't know. (laughs) Who do you call? Who do you call? Is there like a profile of Tinder, the last 28 girl guys she, she hooked up with for us to see how it was? No, we don't have that profile. It's a good idea though. It would be a great idea, but it's not going to be out there. You know how it's not going to be. It's always like, it's always glass or trash in the company. There's no never glass or trash in the employees right. who didn't work well or they were like, you know, smoking on the, you know, doing this. You don't have that. It's always the other side, right? Okay. So again, it goes back to having a strategy on how to look for the wife. I read a book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged by Norman Wright. I answered all the questions. I'm like, oh my God, I thought I was looking for this for a wife. I'm looking for this. This is what's important to me. My wife and I, I was did the exercise with four girls. My wife and I did the exercise. I said, here's a book. We went on our first, uh, second date. I went to church in the morning. We had breakfast with my dad. Then we went to Santa Monica to do the stairs in Santa Monica. I love the stairs. Then we went to Earth Cafe. After Earth Cafe, I took her to Third Street Promenade. We went to Borders. I bought her a book on our second date, 101 questions to ask before you get engaged. I said, I want you to read this book. I've already read it. I've answered it. When you're ready with your answers, let's get back together. One week later, six hour meeting. We went through all the answers. By the end of it, I said, I think this is it. A year and a half later, we got married. Now we got four kids. Been married for 14 and a half years. You know, December of this year will be, we've been dating since 07, which is what? It'll be 16 years of dating December 29th, right? Did we ever think this was going to happen? No. How do I, how is it going to work out next 16 years? I don't know, but we're good. We've been together for 14 years. Marriage is very complicated. You got to be careful on the way you do it. However, for the people that is part of the camp that is saying, don't get married. Oh my God. You know, I can't imagine life not taking certain risks. Yeah. One of the risks is the risk of getting married, the risk of having kids, yeah. the risk of being a company that's a startup or I'm growing it or I'm starting it. There's certain risks in life. I don't think life is worth living without taking those risks. Marriage is risky. Having kids is risky. If you do it right, some of your greatest memories are going to be, yeah. you know, in that relationship. Um, but it is risky and you have to be very detailed and intentional when you do it. You can't wink marriage. Yeah, I completely agree. It's risky and it's work. So I'll share, I'll share with you a little story, uh, with, which I oftentimes share with, with some women. And that is I dated like a machine, Pat. I dated like a machine because in my twenties, 
it dawned on me that the person that I'm going to marry is going to be far more important than any career I build. I can change careers, but you know, I'm a product of a divorce. There have been many divorces. I grew up in Los Angeles, many divorces around me. And so I was very, very intentional on finding the right match. My roommate used to say to me that I don't even know the price of food because I used to go out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> for dates. But I was very intentional about that. And, and it was really a, a realization that I had, which was I can always change my careers and my career is going to change and grow. But my spouse... My spouse is for life. And mm -hmm. so I put a lot of work into it. And I still do. Like you say, I, we've been married. Noah and I have been married for 13 years. It's not always midsummer night's dream, right? It's There are really tough moments. It's one of those things that you continue to work on. But I don't know how I would do anything I do without having a, a partner in crime to go through this life that's trying to bang us down all the time. And we all go through tough times in life, whether it's, you know, aging parents or children or business. But when you have somebody that is going to stand strong by you, it makes it just a little no easier question. to get up that following no morning and keep going. And I think it's frankly really sad that both men and women, but especially young women are told that you don't need a man. Marriage is overrated. Wait until your fifties, have a career first. It's horrendous. It's terrible. It's, it's frankly yeah. so sad to me. People like us are able to have both because we have the perspective of what's more important. Who's your favorite person you met in your life? Favorite person you ever met in your life? Rank your favorite people in your life. Well, I think it depends. But the, the person I love to spend most time with is my husband. Okay. Who's afterwards? Who's after Who's that? after that? Yeah. My kids. Okay. How many kids do you have? Three. Can you imagine not meeting those three kids? No, my, 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 my world would be empty without my children. But think about like, you don't get married and you don't meet those three human beings. Yeah. You know, I, I look at these guys, but you know, my two-year-old, my seven-year-old, my 10-year-old, my 11-year-old. I can't even imagine not meeting these human beings that God put in my life. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine it. Yeah. I've had a lot of weird experiences. I've had... Been all over the world, you know, 45 plus countries, traveled, have a lot of great experiences. There is nothing that comes close to family. Yeah. Nothing. So to, to risk not having that and experiencing that to me is, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like you work for a company and the company has 10 benefits they offer. A free membership to Equinox. Company's willing to pay for it. Okay. A... You know, annual company trip that they're willing to send you to anywhere you want to go, $5,000 budget for travel, okay? A benefit program for you to have the company buy you a car, car payment all the way up to $1,000, company will pay for it, right? All these benefits, you don't take advantage of it. Yeah. Life has certain benefits it offers. Marriage and kids are two of them. Yeah. You don't want to take advantage of those two, the biggest benefits life offers. One of the uh, proverbs I read uh, was, uh, every man should do three things. Write a book, plant a tree, have a son, yeah. right? Yeah. I still have to plant a tree. Yeah. But, you know, uh, every man should do those three things. A part of that story, mm. I fully agree with. It's something that lives, Yeah. you know, yeah. after you and I are no longer here. Yeah, I think anybody listening to this, if you don't, if you're not married and you don't have kids, drop everything you're doing and go <laughs> and go seek it. Uh, I want to end with a quick uh, word association game. Sure. Because there's a lot I like to hear from you. I want to get through some additional themes that uh, I'm not sure we touched upon. So your association with any of the following. Equity. Nonsense. Equality. Earn it. Shame. Terrible state of mind. Do you think we should shame bad behavior? You know, now there's this thing where you don't slut shame, you don't fat shame, you don't bad behavior shame. Yeah, what are your I, thoughts I, on that? I, I, you ever read the book Power Versus Force? No. Okay, so it's a good book to read. And he breaks down the, the first phase where your consciousness is in good consciousness. At the lowest level, he has apathy, shame, guilt, da da da, da and it goes to anger, desire, desire, like I desire drugs, alcohol, women, like that kind of desire. Then it goes to pride, and then right after pride, the first uh, uh, consciousness you hit that's very good for you is courage. Mm -hmm. you, have the, you have the courage to be wrong. 
You have the courage to put yourself out there. Then it goes to, I think, willingness. You're willing to talk. Acceptance. I'm accepting people are flawed and not everybody is perfect. And we all, I'm accepting our differences. So courage, willingness, acceptance, reason. Then it's love, joy, enlightenment. Enlightenment, nobody gets to. That's Jesus is where the author puts it, right? So for me, shame is a, is a uh, bad place for you to individually be in. Now, for me, if you're fat, you're fat. Stop saying you're big bone. You're fat. If you can't control yourself from what you want to put in your stomach, don't go around telling me that it's you know, society's fault. No, stop eating burgers. Stop eating you know, Big Macs. Stop eating all that stuff. Uh, that level of accountability, I'm all about accountability. Uh, shame, you know, a person that's in a shame place typically is very bad for society. Uh, you touched upon this tolerance. Mm-mm. No tolerance. Um, I used to pray for four things. Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. I no longer ask God for tolerance. Mm-hmm. I don't ask for tolerance. I don't pray for it. I'm scared to ask for tolerance because the way he gives it, you know, he's, he's got a sense of humor and he's creative. I don't, I don't pray for tolerance because um, going back to the non-negotiables, mm-hmm. people who are too tolerant, they compromise their non-negotiables. I'm not for mm-hmm. it. Stand your ground. Let people know where your position is. But at the same time, to be tolerant of everything where we're allowing people to do everything they're doing, that they're eventually going to come and do it to your kids. Then what are you going to do? Hmm. It's too late, but it's your fault. You were way too tolerant. Yeah. Now, I'm not comfortable with that word today. Hmm. Courage over tolerance. All day long. Yeah. Final word, 2024. The year of investigations and strikes. The year of investigations and strikes. They're going to continue doing this. This is going to be a very ugly year. Remember the whole thing where I was trying to do this? Mm. This is going to go further this year. Mm. Because now they're doing it to each other. First time ever. Hey, president got impeached twice. Hey, let's impeach the next president. Hey, speaker of the house got fired after. Hey. It's like, it's, it's, it's too weird. It's too much. However, here's the positive news on what's coming up. A Gallup poll came out. I don't know if you've seen this Gallup poll or not. It's, it's fantastic to see it about economy. So, and you know, Gallup, Pew Research, they're not left or right, they're right in the middle. They're not part of a political party. They just straight up do, it's not a CNN poll or a Fox poll. So Gallup does a poll about w- American people whose economy they trust more. This is the biggest gap, biggest ever, that Americans trust Republicans running the economy than Democrats. It's a 14-point difference. You have to see this. It's absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. 40. So Democrats are saying we trust Republicans are better at the economy than Democrats. Okay. And there's a couple other issues they talk about as well, you know, military protection, safety, all these things. Uh, the poll is flipped. Huh. Everything right now, the average American relates to conservative Republican policies more than they do to liberal Democratic policies. Everything. The other day, there's a book that comes out uh, uh, on LGBTQ that certain teachers are passing around to their kids. You know what's one of the sections in the book? How to argue with Muslims. 74% of Muslims vote Democrat. Why? You ever thought about that? Why do Muslims vote Democrat? That's the question I'm asking Muslims when I'm bringing them on the podcast. What for? What part of their policies matches your faith? I We have differences. I'm a Christian, you're a Muslim, but what part of these things matches you. So now imagine if weird people unify. Imagine if Muslims and Christians are like, look, man, I don't believe in, you know, Muhammad, your team, Jesus, your Muhammad, your this, your Sharia. Your... We're not on the same page there. When it comes down to boom, 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 we're on the same page in these areas. What if we fight here? So all these ludicrous policies is forcing people to defend each other that they would have never defended each other. Mm-hmm. Such a weird thing. It's like, wait a minute, why am I defending that guy? I would have never voted or defended that guy. Why are you forcing me to do this? Joe Rogan is defending Trump. <laughs> I mean, in, in what life would you have agreed that that's going to be taking place? Joe Rogan and Elon Musk are saying, you know, the best thing you can do is vote Republican. Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? You, you're the guy that just a few years ago were saying legalize marijuana. You voted for Bernie Sanders. That guy went from Bernie all the way up to now saying this. What changed? They used their card too much on COVID. 
Yeah. And they bullied the wrong people and true believers woke up. And you do not want to face true believers. Yeah. Because they're 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 relentless and they're tough and they don't compromise. So I think 2024 is going to be very ugly. But I think it's going to lead to it's going to be very ugly politically next year. It's not going to slow down the ugliness. But I think the people that they were trying to divide are now starting to see things that they have in common. It's very yeah. weird. I think that's what's happening right now. Well, we'll brace for the storm and appreciate building new friendships. Thank you, Pat. This was fascinating. Thanks for having me on. This was great. I appreciate you. Appreciate Thank you. Appreciate it.